Um, I'm Ines Fuentes from um, the education group at AGU. It's a new department now. We're called Strategic Communications and Outreach. And we're very pleased to have this workshop. It's something that actually in outreach we've been wanting to do for quite a long time. We've been hearing people like Matthew Nisbet and, and realizing that it's very important for our community to hear what the social scientists are learning about how to communicate science so that people who are not scientists understand and can do something with that information. So, um, and it's great to see um, many people, I, we don't, they're new faces, which is wonderful. So we're not talking to the same group of people that we always talk to. Um, there will, each, each of the presenters will give talks. There will be a question and answer afterwards and then a panel discussion. And just briefly, uh, since I men mentioned Matthew Nisbet is a professor of communications at American University. And um, let's see, Bax um, Boykoff is an assistant professor in the Center for Science and Technology Policy, which is, it's a very long title, po <laughs> Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences, a series, if a lot of you know, at the University of Colorado Boulder. And Gwendolyn Blue is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Communication and Culture at the University of Calgary. And Gwendolyn has actually just flown in from the meeting and from Copenhagen. So, um, and she does very interesting work in, in sort of uh, looking at public engagement and how do you get the public involved in these kinds of issues that, that aren't just science but that are global and social issues. Thank you. Uh, well, in, in talking about uh, uh, setting up today's uh, uh, panel before I hand it off uh, to Max for the first presentation, um, our goal was to uh, bring together uh, social scientists who are studying uh, different dimensions of media and communication related to climate change um, and to focus on issues related to public uh, engagement and public understanding that might be relevant to uh, AGU, A AGU attendees. Um, and I think you'll see some common themes in the presentations today, and I'll just briefly uh, kind of identify some of those common themes to kind of set, set some context. Um, one, I think you'll see uh, uh, at least the first two presentations uh, focusing on factors that um, uh, might be driving patterns in news attention over time and currently on climate change, and also the factors that might shape the presentation of both the science and, and the policy debate. Um, you'll also uh, uh, hear uh, about research that looks at um, how these selective presentations in the media are related to public understanding and public perceptions and to different types of po policy outcomes or the direction of the policy debate. And I think you'll also hear um, uh, uh, emphasis on uh, the need for uh, new initiatives uh, related to climate change communication um, that increase direct public participation in collective decisions both at the local, national, uh, and international level and that also in the, in, in the process enhance overall uh, public learning uh, trust uh, and overall sense of accountability. Um, and I think also you'll hear uh, an emphasis uh, also in, in, in the Q&A as well as the challenge of localizing discussion and focus and attention uh, to some of the local impacts and some of the local relevance of climate change instead of just climate change being perceived as a national or international political debate. And I think importantly, I think, um, with the theories, principles, and initiatives that are, are, are discussed here today, um, you know, the applications of, of this research is not intended for, uh, to serve uh, advocacy purposes. Uh, it's often uh, misinterpreted as such. Um, and instead, it, the, the, the application of the research and the, and the principles here is really intended in part to be translated in a way that can help government agencies, science organizations, media organizations, universities, and places like science centers and science museums uh, make climate change more personally relevant and significant in the process increase attention and understanding of both climate science and po climate policy and ultimately to empower the public uh, to, uh, to actively participate in an informed way in collective decisions at the local, national, and international levels. So uh, with that, I just want to hand it off to Max uh, for uh, the first presentation. And each presentation will be followed by um, a shorter 10-minute uh, questions from the audience, and at the end of all three presentations, we'll open it up for uh, a more general discussion and, and Q&A. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Matt, and um, thank you all for coming. I'm, I'm happy to be a part of this uh, huddling, I suppose, of just making sense of the many complex interactions between uh, science communities, 
policy actors, uh, the public, uh, broadly construed. What's, what's interesting to me in this issue is understanding mass media representations as they're nested in these larger uh, contextual spaces, as I call them, uh, cultural politics. So really understanding how formal climate science, climate science is the focus of my work, uh, climate science and policy find meaning in people's everyday lives. This is understanding how this meaning is constructed through media representational practices, how it's negotiated between actors, be it within the newsroom, uh, through interactions with scientists uh, and politicians, policy actors, and so forth. And really understanding both the presence and amplification of certain ways of talking about these issues and the, the, uh, really the absence of them. And time permitting, I could get into some uh, particular points of absences in discourses. What kinds of discussions are not considered permissible in this, in this uh, grand stage? And this, this has nested questions of how we make, understand and, and make these issues meaningful in our everyday lives. And that's important to me to consider questions of power. Um, without getting too enmeshed, I hope, in, in social science jargon, I do value how these cultural aspects are situated also in political economics and how our material well-being, our material lives are, are part of an interaction between the way that we're talking about, thinking about, considering uh, discussions uh, on climate change and actions therein. So it's, it's important in that way, and this happens vice versa. I think one prominent example that's just recent, uh, recently been covered is that the Obama administration had, had uh, changed their language deliberately on climate change and on greenhouse gas emissions that there was a piece that came out earlier this year that talked about how they had been orchestrating discussions around greenhouse gas emissions rather as carbon pollution and heat trapping emissions. And uh, NOAA Chief Jane Lubchenco had said, and I quote, the, the choice of the term is intended to make what's happening more understandable and more accessible to non-technical audiences. This calls a spade a spade. It says what is, but it, in, it is in a way less jargony. And so whether this be nested in more nefarious practices of special interest groups or whether this be a, a way to try and better communicate the science that's, uh, that's being undertaken by many of you in this room and other spaces, this is part of that give and take between the way that we're talking about these issues and possible changes in attitudes, intentions, and behaviors in everyday life. So climate change is clearly one of these high profile, highly politicized, high stakes arenas where this is very prominent, these, these interactions. So uh, while time is at a premium, I'm gonna try and get through these four main points, just touch on a few issues around the trends in media coverage of climate change, mainly in, in the past five, 10 years. Uh, second, just hone in on one empirical set of studies that I've been involved with that look at how mass media, largely newspapers, have been covering uh, human contributions to climate change, then broaden this out to multiple scale factors and processes, touch on some of the challenges, some of the impediments that scientists face, that journalists face, that policy actors face in these processes of communication, then broaden it out further to pose a few ongoing challenges. And, and as I speak, a number of these things uh, will be taken up, as I understand it, with the other presenters, and, and it would be great to continue with uh, during the discussion. So first, the role of mass media. I may not need to convince people much of this. This is one quote from W. Lance Bennett talking about the importance of mass media in our everyday lives. We're perhaps in this room a self-selected group of people interested in these issues. Nonetheless, I would argue that few of us still wake up in the morning and first thing we do, get a cup of coffee and pick up the most recent issue of Science or Nature. Maybe there are some of us in this room that do do that. But most people are, are uh, consuming mass media in various forms, television, newspapers, radio, internet, as a triage into understanding the science as it's unfolding, into understanding policy activities. Personally, uh, sorry, I think the math is too close. I, I, uh, I sometimes read about research that's, being, that's been undertaken by my own colleagues that I've read through mass media and traced it back to the studies themselves. Largely, the the population that doesn't have access to these, these uh, journals and things are, are, large, are just relying on mass media as a way of understanding, a way of knowing what's going on here. So just a few figures. First, this comes from the Pew Center for People in the Press. 
just demonstrating that the, the different ways in which people are getting this information has been changing over time. And as you can see here in the United States, Internet has just recently outpaced newspapers. There's quite a intense and important discussion being had about the, the atrophying of, of the newspaper industry here in the United States. This demonstrates one of the trends that, that we can look to as in a way in which it may continue. And I'll say a few more words on that in just a moment. In terms of new media uh, increasingly dominating this space, but television still is largely uh, the, most, the most accessed news source. So about new media, this is ongoing content analysis that's done by the uh, Project for Excellence in Journalism. I believe it's at Columbia University. And this is just splicing out, they do it each week. This splices out the October news, the October 12th to the 18th news cycle. And you can see actually on the bottom is the traditional mass media sources. And they talk about which sources they use as indicators of that. You can see healthcare, a number of other issues, Balloon Boy, if you recall Balloon Boy in Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh, but then if you look to new media, global warming was at the top of discussions through blogs and other spaces. Uh, and this was about recent uh, UK, I think it was Hadley Center data that, that had um, come out. Was it Met Office? I see you shaking your head. I'm trying to, what's that? It was from East Anglia? in October about okay no I'm gonna to get to that part I'm talking about October there was a Hadley a Met Office study I should just dig it up that that showed that the warming trends had had subsided and that's what was driving this new media cycle I do actually have on the next slide or the next couple of panels here this crew email um, hacking and and however it's being framed and I think Matt's gonna talk about this further this is the news cycle that they just put up on Thursday, showing the previous week. That again, the uh, mainstream press dominated by Afghanistan, the economy, Tiger Woods, and so on. But in the blogosphere, global warming is still up there. And actually, they've done some work looking at Twitter and the links made through Twitter, and global warming's up there as well. Dominated by this, this uh, hacking and these uh, discussions coming out of the University of East Anglia in the UK. This draws attention to, you know, not necessarily a more is better, but it can raise questions about how the increased profile of climate change, of global warming in new media may be something to look out for here in terms of the ways in which this can build public understanding. Uh, on the other hand, this can fuel ongoing politicization of climate change, where these are very much opinion uh, pieces in, in the blogosphere. And this can also contribute to information silos for those of us who continue to just go to the sources that we agree with, read the blogs, fortify our position, or maybe go to someone else's blog that we disagree with and fortify why we disagree with that. But nonetheless, this is one of the trends that is unfolding in the difference between traditional mass media coverage, and that's, that's for the most part had about, what, 1% of the news hole over time just for the environment and climate change being a subset. So something to consider. As moving just into climate change and newspaper coverage of, of climate change around the world, this was just a um, broad look of 50 newspapers across, I think it was 20 countries from 1988 through the end of 2006. There's a paper I did with Timmons Roberts for the UNDP. Um, and we just were, wanted to document the ebbs and flows of coverage. We categorized it in these two ways, and you can see that in the mid to late 1980s, the, it's been uh, discussed how this issue moved into the public arena for reasons of James Hansen's uh, testimony to the U.S. Senate in the summer of 1988 saying it's time to stop waffling that uh, global warming has begun. Uh, the, U the heat wave and drought that, that uh, predominated in North America, the formation of the IPCC in 1988, Margaret Thatcher had a few words to say in the Royal Society of London, out uh, of the Royal Society. It, in 1988, that this moved on to the public scene then. Uh, and there are ebbs and flows uh, over time, and, and some of the work I've done is, has understood this. Broadly, considering it in four main ways, political activities, scientific activities, cultural activities, and then ecological or, or meteorological activities. So, um, and I can talk about that further later. This picks it up, this is ongoing media monitoring that, that I'm doing at the University of Colorado now that I'd started at the University of Oxford where I was before with Maria Mansfield. 
where we've just been documenting these 50 newspapers, now breaking it down into five regions, and understanding the ebbs and flows of coverage starting in 2004. So it picks it up, again, you can see in the middle of this, it, it picks up through that hockey stick-like increase uh, in the previous slide. And you can see there had been a decrease into 2007, 2008. There are many reasons that we could point to, maybe the uh, news hole shrinking for these uh, issues in, in contrast with the growing economic crisis or economic meltdown. Uh, that this wasn't a large campaign issue separating Obama and, and uh, McCain in the, in the previous presidential election. There are a number of reasons. Also, another one could be that the, that the uh, discussions of climate change, the coverage of climate change in these newspapers had been changing as well. Not as predominant about the science, explicitly invoking climate change or global warming, but moving into questions of energy security, questions of sustainability, that intersect with climate change issues, but may not be captured by our explicit search for climate change or global warming in these papers. Interestingly, though, you can see that we just updated this to the end of November, and it's going up again. And uh, it remains to be seen how uh, negotiators, perhaps in Copenhagen and elsewhere in the US Congress, other places, may see media attention as a proxy for public pressure on issues around climate change, of putting forward strong policy proposals, but this is one way of just documenting the amount of coverage. So the bulk of my work actually has looked at the content of coverage, and I'll just turn to a few panels here and then, um, and then move into some of that empirical work. So one of, the, one of the challenges that I've documented, that I've observed over time in mass media coverage of climate change is the tendency to conflate many distinct issues into one great global warming issue, hence a great global warming debate, perhaps seen in, in the many different stories that come out every day. I think quite um, interestingly captured in, in a film called The Great Global Warming Swindle, which was produced in the UK. Um, also, it's playing itself out, I think, in terms of the in various interpretations of these crew emails and the links to what's called climate gate in some cases. Nonetheless, this is a challenge to be covering the various com complexities of climate change uh, by journalists. And I just have four panels here. The these are schematics just to try and demonstrate perhaps the convergence of agreement in the scientific community of these statements. And this was through discussions with Andrew Revkin at the New York Times, and he had first talked about this at the uh, Society of Environmental Journalists in 2006 their conference. So increased CO2 warms the planet. I'm arguing that there is a great deal of scientific convergent agreement that that statement is, is evident. Over time, this continues to converge through increasing scientific information that, that substantiates that point. And over time, there are, effort, there are indications that there is a divergence here as well, maybe those that disagree. And uh, maybe the interpretation of those crew emails can challenge this a bit. Next panel, human contributions to climate change. Again, arguing that there is this convergent agreement. And mass media sometimes are challenged not to be focused just on the tales here. That there is this community of what are, I think, possibly denigratingly referred to as alarmists. Those who say that if we just rein in our sinful climate changing ways and, and reduce our emissions that we can stabilize the climate. Uh, and on the other side, maybe those that are deemed contrarians that, that claim that human contributions to climate change are negligible. In both cases, I think they're dangerous discourses, yet they get quite a bit of attention in mass media over time. So a third, anthropogenic climate change increases hurricane intensity. I consider this maybe bimodal distribution. People like Judy Curry, Carrie Manuel pushing forward the links, others saying it's too early to tell. And then moving into explicit policy issues, things such as the Kyoto Protocol's successes across the board. So media coverage of the Kyoto Protocol, whether it's a success or not, necessitates a range of voices, a range of views, whereas increased CO2 warming the planet may not necessitate a wide range of views, that there is this conversion agreement. And this brings up questions of expertise, authority, legitimacy that we can discuss further as well. We can do this on a range of other topics within climate change and environment, and I've done this uh, with other issues as well in other writing. The way this can play out, I just have a small video clip 
partly entertainment, partly information, to um, play for you to just show some of the connection, so how this may be demonstrated. This moves us into, away from newspapers in this case, into U.S. local television news. Now, is there a, that's weird, there's not a, Just click on that. Yep. Thanks. So this should play. Now, from NBC 10 News. Today on 10 News Conference Special Assignment, global warming, fact or fiction? If it is happening, what's the cause? And what effect will it have on coastal areas like here in southern New England? If you listen to the proponents, the atmosphere is warming, the glaciers are melting, and sea levels are rising because of pollutants like carbon dioxide man is putting in the air. And if we don't act now, they say the changes to civilization will be catastrophic. On this program, we'll talk about what they suspect will happen. If you listen to the opponents, they say man's not the cause of global warming, it's the sun. And all the hype and hysteria is to keep scientists awash in their $50 billion worth of research grants they've received from governments and corporations over the past two decades. What's really going on? Now, from NBC 10 News, Southern New England's news leader, this is the team you trust with 10 News Conference. Good morning. Okay, so that just this, that's part of the setup, and I could ask you if you think maybe this this debate took place in 1989, 1999, or 2009. Uh, you may have seen that this was something that took place Saturday, November 14th, in Providence, Rhode Island. On the left, actually, on your left, is a sociologist, in the center is a geologist, and on the right is a, a meteorologist. Um, just to point out that. You know, while, and I'll, I'll share in a moment how coverage of human contributions to climate change has improved in the top U.S. newspapers and in the U.K. in some research that I've done, uh, there remain these areas where it's framed in this way as this great climate change debate. Uh, the meteorologist had claimed that, that human contributions are negligible in this case. Incidentally, there's, there's good work by Chris Wilson who looks at television weathercasters as a trusted source of, of uh, for communication of issues of weather and climate. And also, the Pew Center has done ongoing polling that have found that, that people in the United States still regard U.S. local television highly as a good source of information. So this is one example here of the debate. So moving just to that empirical work, I'm going to try and go through this fairly swiftly. And I think I can go through it with, with all of you, that there had been this, this evolution of understanding of detection of human contributions to climate change uh, and attribution to humans articulated through these step processes perhaps in climate science and then uh, articulated I think first most prominently in 1995 in the IPCC report. Okay. So we're focused then on just that second panel. So instead of conflating these, all of these issues, just focused on this area about which um, I argue that there is great uh, convergence of agreement. So I posed the question actually in some research with my brother Jules Boykoff who's at Pacific University in Oregon to, to look at how accurately have U.S. newspapers covered human contributions to climate change and we had first done an assessment this is uh, I'll put up I'm talking about actually the second part first my apologies that we looked at newspaper coverage through 2002 in these top U.S. newspapers and found that 53% of news stories diverged from this scientific consensus. So we found through uh, a quantitative method called content analysis, we had found that there had been this, this divergence uh, where coverage of climate change had been covering both sides of the issue more prominently than this convergence center as I've characterized it. Looking to U.S. television, this was more dramatic that 70 percent of the television segments through 2004 in these stations had also been uh, covering the issue in this way. So we had attributed to this, this uh, journalistic norm of balanced reporting. Um, and this, this gained a good bit of traction at the time and I think that it may have caused a number of scientists, perhaps some of you in this room, to to start to reconsider when you publish your research findings, how might this rep be represented? Al Gore actually took this up in An Inconvenient Truth. This is one of his slides from his film. Uh, Naomi Oreskes's work, an environmental historian at, at the University of California, San Diego, had done this work in peer-reviewed articles. Again, just focused on 
human contributions to climate change, and then held up that uh, lower part of research that I was talking about of media coverage of climate change. And then he made the link, no wonder people are confused. So he was making these connections. One of the interesting things to me, though, is that this film came out in 2006, and the data that, that he relied on, our work, just ran through 2002. And many of the journalists, scientists that I continue to speak with had said things had changed since 2002. Uh, and so I did some research to take a look at if this, in fact, could bore out uh, empirically as well. So as an update, I was actually now living over in the UK, took a look at UK quality newspapers from 2003 to 2006, did not find any divergence. In that same set of US newspapers, actually found that this balanced reporting continued through the end of 2004, and there was this shift into 2005 and 2006. So some of the suspicions that uh, had been communicated to me about this no longer being an issue were indeed uh, found in this research. And so one of the things that I pointed to is that it's good that the film generated this discussion, but it might be actually now focusing us on something that is no, not as prominent a challenge and that we can look to other challenges, and there are many of them in communications between science, media, and the public. And finally, though, just pointing out there is a very distinct, for those of you who know the UK media well, there's a very distinct uh, grouping of the quality newspapers, the Guardian, Times, Telegraph, Independent, and what are considered tabloid newspapers, which are the Sun, uh, the Daily Mail, the Express, um, and a few others, that, that in, there's a real distinction in terms of readership, where working class people are very much reading these tabloid newspapers. It's been demonstrated. Also, the circulations of the Sun, for instance, is 12 times that of the Guardian on any given day. Um, and we had found in ongoing research with Maria Mansfield that, that it wasn't balanced reporting, but it was actually the promulgation of contrarian views in these sources that had, that had um, contributed to an informational bias in these papers. So situating this, and I'll work to situate it, draw a few conclusions, and then um, open it up to discussion. But situating this, the journalistic norm of balance can be placed in many different journalistic norms that translate issues, events, information into what we, can, we see as news and media coverage. The, some of the work that I've done is, is broken this down over time and how these have played out. One that I found interesting in just the last few days was this personalization norm, where complex climate science can be distilled into this dueling, this duel between prominent personalities. This came from the O'Reilly factor on December 9th actually showed up on CNN this morning as well, juxtaposing the views of Gore with the views of Sarah Palin, who had written a Washington Post opinion piece just recently. And this climate feud, as it's described here, as it's uh, Bill O'Reilly talks about as providing both sides of the story so you all can decide, uh, really takes us away from some of, from many of those larger scale institutional challenges that we face as a scientific community in terms of political economics, carbon-based industry and society and the like. So asking the larger question, how do various factors and pressures pressure shape media coverage of climate change? There are many contextual factors that go into shaping media representations. The first I have here is technical capacity issues. Things such as the, <clears throat> the shrinking uh, specialist journalist, well not the journalist, but the shrinking pool of specialist journalists covering this issue. You all may have discovered that people that you're talking to are increasingly generalists, asked to cover a wide range of issues on any given day. And it makes it very difficult for that generalist journalist to be discussing and covering and, and representing the intricacies of your findings uh, in a confined space of column inches and a confined time to deadline. So this is one issue. Weather events driving the news cycle, Hurricane Katrina, to the extent that it's linked to climate change is still open. Um, but in news coverage around that time, it provided a news hook into discussing climate change. Philosophical perspectives, I'll just point you to Mike Hume's new book. Mike Hume is actually at the University of East Anglia, who talks about um, how different ideological perspectives, religious perspectives, come to the table to shape the way that we view climate change as a problem. 
Political, economic, and drivers, drivers and pressures can be those large-scale pressures of mass media consolidation down to the decisions of individual journalists in a confined, confined space. Uh, in terms of time to deadline, University of Cardiff researchers had found that now journalists face a third the time to deadline in the UK than they did in 1985, and this constrains their ability to do the kind of reporting that they'd like to do. Um, a, another thing to point out to link it back to new media is that uh, there, had, there have been journalists that have moved into internet reporting that have found, they've said, has given them that space and time to provide uh, better, more uh, satisfactory coverage. One of them is Richard Black from the BBC, who's widely regarded, uh, has, is uh, regarded as a good, as reporting well on these issues, has moved to BBC Online. And then you have journalistic norms that I had mentioned. This, maybe like a fine wine, takes time to, to uh, appreciate, but I, uh, I just put it up here. Annabella Carvalho and Jackie Burgess have done good work in this arena of understanding the production of mass media into the public space, its uptake in that public space, and then its incorporation into our individual lives. So it, there, this figure demonstrates what they go on to talk about, this dispelling the myth of this information deficit model of communication that instead of just providing the, the scientific findings for the public or the mass media to report and the public to take up, that it's a complex set of interactions over time that we all interpret it and uh, incorporate it into our lives differently. So I've just been focused here on the production of mass media. I know that, that uh, Matt covers quite, quite a bit this attention economy, this space of the public uptake as well. And this, so I'm just, it's useful for me to put this up to show that what I'm doing here in the, is just focusing on this production into the public space of texts, mainly. So with the remaining time, I'm probably pretty short on time. I have uh, two examples that I just want to share uh, of challenges. The first of which is that what do these challenges mean for researchers interacting with the media? There is this inherent challenge of communicating one's work, that of caution, probability jargon and a crisp commentary, this brevity, this certainty that's valued by journalists in a hurry, valued by policy actors in a hurry, people of the public in a hurry. And Henry Pollock has referred to this as the challenge of translating error bars into ordinary language. Malcolm Hughes, who's moved back into the public space uh, with the crew emails, has, has said that we scientists are a little too unwilling to say things as we see this misuse of information and policy. Many of you may know that he's the second author on the men at all study in 1998, and his work has been heavily scrutinized in this way. So he cautions that this can become a real time sink and very stressful. But Al Gore steps into this space to say that if not the scientists, then who? That more increasingly non-nation state actors, you know, people f from NGOs, from special interest groups, think tanks and the like, will step into this space. Journalists need copy, they need quotes, they need to run a story that with scientists recoiling into their stereotypical laboratories, that this has an, an effect on, on the agendas that are set in the public space through mass media. Finally, just another dimension to consider this is that Andrew Revkin talks about the challenge as a journalist of covering this incremental story, difficult to fit into that standard template of news. Uh, due to some of the journalistic norms that I mentioned, and just that this can be a creeping story, that it needs that dramatic news hook. So the second example is um, moving into the newsroom itself. Journalists and editor interactions are really important here. Scientific input certainly feeds into this, but this is a story that came out in 2008 in The Observer. Surgeon fatal shark attacks blamed on global warming, a nice scary shark photo. I haven't talked much about how imagery also plays into these discussions. I've just been focused on text. But surgeon fatal shark attacks, you can think of this as perhaps suggested as an indicator of global warming. But reading into it, George Burgess at Florida University talks about the one thing that's affecting shark attacks more than anything else is human activity. So the more people are in the water, the more shark attacks there are. That's essentially the point he's making. Further down in the paper, in the article, the journalist writes, another contributory factor, the location of shark attacks, could be global warming and rising sea temperatures. A speculative comment, I haven't talked with George Burgess about this, but perhaps not the focus of George's 
research, yet mentioned later in the article and taken up as this news-grabbing headline by the copy editor or sub-editor. Okay. Going forward, just having read this newspaper while living over there, I found this follow-up story, a short story, Sharks Go Hungry as Tourists Stay Home, an updated story, again with George Burgess, mentioning that shark attacks are on the decline. So <clears throat> perhaps one of the, um, one of the uh, unintended consequences of making these links of shark attacks as an indicator of global warming can be this reduction of shark attacks. Somebody reading this could think, okay, we got this thing covered now. We, uh, the sharks are hungry and climate change may not be as, as uh, big a threat as we'd considered it. So these are one of the unintended consequences that happens within the newsroom itself. So finally, just this is my last slide. There are many ongoing challenges and, and the other speakers will talk to them as well. What, I have three. The first is this ongoing problem framing. This moves us into uh, Matt's work, certainly, of looking at this as a scientific problem, looking at this as a political problem, moral, ethical, and so forth. Here in the United States, uh, Aaron McCright and Riley Dunlop have demonstrated this in work to show that it is largely framed, uh, it, the views of this are largely uh, determined through political lenses. This asks two questions about the effects of global warming and coverage of it in the news. Democrats in blue, Republicans in red, seen widely, seen very differently through this, uh, through this lens. Over in the, in the UK, this has broadly been treated as an ethical moral issue, I've argued, where the, where the typically conservative party, the Tory party, had, had outpledged reductions um, in the UK at one point than the Labour Party. There's a big difference here between rhetoric and action on the ground uh, shifts that Roger Pilkey Jr., who's, who's uh, at the University of Colorado, has, has demonstrated as well. Nonetheless, the ongoing problem framing is very important across uh, countries in particular. Second point is there's interventions from other actors. I mentioned this in terms of the agenda setting function that increasingly, and for those of you who are in Copenhagen, Gwendolyn and others may have seen the increasing presence of NGOs, businesses, celebrities that are stepping in and, and speaking to these issues and generating uh, a lot of press attention here. I've actually done some work looking at celebrity actors and it was it's tempting to dismiss this as fringe uh, pop culture, but it's actually important to think about in terms of engaging people who otherwise may not be taking an interest in these issues. So it's something to continue to look out for. Finally, just a point that we face an ongoing challenge of translating our own work, communicating our research in an accurate, effective way. There have been different mobilizing metaphors over time, the greenhouse effect, maybe the Obama administration disagrees at this point, uh, the hockey stick, the bathtub analogy, but nowadays it's incumbent upon all of us in science not to see media interactions as an extension of our responsibilities, but rather a fabric of the responsibility that we have. And, and I'm sure each of you have seen this played out in how your work has been represented and what kind of a role you can play as a researcher, as an academic, in continuing to shape these discussions through mass media. Thanks. So we have, um uh, a few minutes for co uh, com uh, comments or questions on, on Max's presentation. Yeah. I, I think we're recording this, so I think if you have to make a question or a comment, please come up to the microphone. Yeah, in uh, Miami-Dade County in South Florida, uh, the effect of sea level rise is the climate change issue that matters. And we have uh, mobilized the governments of Dade, Broward, uh, Palm Beach, and Monroe County to essentially take leadership in this. We're cutting out the, the usual media circus, and it's uh, been a, an amazing transformation. I mean, the, the effects of climate change uh, in, in the drainage of the Everglades water out uh, after heavy rains will be uh, noticeably much less in 10 or 15 years. So this is not something in the, the uh, vague, distant future. This is something that's coming at us right now, and we uh, we forecast between three and five feet of sea level rise by the end of the uh, 2100, and that's based on uh, largely glacial ice melting. And it's, uh, it, it seemed like an outlier to begin with, but now uh, the Corps of Engineers has essentially endorsed that. And so they're a serious bunch of people. <laughs>
And so we're, we're sort of cir cir uh, essentially short-circuiting the, uh, the media blitz stuff by actually going through the government process. Uh, there are uh, politicians in South Florida who are particularly uh, enlightened. Harvey Rubin has been a leader for 30 years and, uh, and there are other uh, scientists and, and uh, particularly um, um, politicians who have essentially stepped up to the plate. Yep. I'd, I'd like to come back to that, uh, to, to your work in the, in the general Q&A, because I think it's, uh, one of the issues that will be raised is, is, is localizing the issue, and, and, and maybe you can uh, comment about uh, some of the work that you're doing with the local media or, or other types of local engagement. Do you, can you come up to the, the microphone? Hi, my name is Melanie Fitzpatrick. I work for the Union of Concerned Scientists based in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, thanks for your talk about the misinformation of science. I, I have a question. Given the, the low scientific literacy, um, particularly in the United States, can you maybe um, talk about how that might contribute to our lack of being able to communicate these science, uh, very important science uh, findings to the public? Yep. Yeah, I may, I may not have a lot to say about that, but it certainly plays in science literacy from early education through uh, the adult population is, is, is an important piece of this puzzle that, uh, you know, there are limits to, there are explanatory limits to looking at media representations and getting a sense of public understanding, public engagement, that these limits, you know, people can read things and it doesn't, it's a mistake to think that having read something then uh, makes them necessarily more aware, makes them change their behaviors in this. Uh, so science literacy as a foundation is an important piece of, of uh, before understanding these media interactions. Um, and that's actually what's led me into some of this research around uh, celebrities as a way into engaging people to increase scientific literacy possibly in more creative ways and that can lead us into interactions in different forms outside of news is, is what I've been covering mainly but it's important. So you talked a little bit about the contrast between the US and the UK media representation I wasn't sure if you were saying there was a big difference there and if there is what might explain it? Well the empirical work I was talking about had um, had demonstrated that in those quality newspapers, as they've been described, that there hadn't been an informational bias in terms of human contributions to climate change, that they had actually been covering that issue accurately. In, bo in both countries? Since 2005, okay. that's right. And in the entire study period of the UK newspapers, that hadn't been the case in the tabloid newspapers, that there had been still this divergence in coverage that, that we had attributed to contrarian voices. Uh, there's somebody that comes to mind by the name of Jeremy Clarkson, who uh, has a popular auto show on BBC, some of you may know. And he writes a column in The Sun and repeatedly uh, voices his, his uh, contrarian views on climate change. And so it's, that's been something distinct in the UK media that, that, um, that has been evident through that work. I think one of the things that we can point to, and, and maybe uh, Matt and Gwendolyn will want to talk about this more, from from communications is that the, uh, there's a strong firewall in, in the U.S. between news reporting and, and editorials, at least in theory, where this is a much grayer space over in the U.K. So there can be this movement between uh, opinion journalism and straight news reporting in subtle ways that may have an influence on coverage. Okay, and if I can ask a follow-up question, I want to ask the same question about the politics because you mentioned in the U.K. the Conservative Party uh, which is the, 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 the right-wing party is, is more on board with the science, whereas in the UK with the Republican, within the US, the Republican Party isn't. So I was wondering if you had insights into that. Yep, that's a huge issue that gets us into, you know, cultural, uh, historical questions, maybe even just the questions of individualism in the United States, questions of um, the entrenchment of carbon-based industry and their lobbying voices on the US Congress in this case, that, uh, and the intense pressure that has traditionally been put uh, in shaping understanding within Congress here in the United States that isn't as intense over in the UK. So there's just a few ideas. 
Uh, my name is Chuck Hakarainen, and I'm a retired research manager in climate areas living near here in Belmont, California. I'm very intrigued by the difference in the coverage between the newspapers, the blogs, and the Twitters yeah. um, in terms of the topics they discuss. And I was wondering if what your uh, insights are into that. Is it the nature of the, the topics or the nature of the media that says you can't talk about climate in anything that involves less than 149 characters? Hmm. Like you, Twitter limits, I guess, limits you. You have to say it in less than 149 right. characters. Maybe both of you would have something to say about that as well. I mean, I, I think that the increasing politicization of the climate change issue makes it a topic for discussion in these blogs, makes it a topic of back and forth in ways that, uh, that gets picked up by this, uh, this content analysis that traditional media reporting on it um, has been limited in that way of, of the interactive nature of, of new media. Uh, that would be one way. Um, perhaps another way that, you know, and I'm, these are open questions, thinking about the editorial process within many of these traditional news sources, the gatekeepers. You know, talking to journalists over time, they say, you know, who really is important here are the gatekeepers of editors, sub-editors, and so forth, that the editorial process may be having an influence on the amount of coverage on, of traditional news media, of picking up on some of these themes, whereas new media, you know, these move out into cyberspace with little, uh, little editorial intervention. I agree with that, um, with, with Max's um, interpretation. I talked a little bit about my presentation, but I would just add, add to that. Uh, if you look at what, uh, what Andy Revkin has done with uh, .earth, uh, he talks about how the, the blog actually enables him to get around what he's called the, the tyranny of the news peg, that, you know, how difficult it is to, to cover climate change on a daily basis. It also allows him to get around his editor uh, in terms of uh, pitching stories into the paper. Um, so I think, uh, you know, the, the, it's, it's easier to cover and talk about climate change on an ongoing basis via a blog uh, in combination with this, uh, I think, as I'll talk about, ideological fragmentation that's also going on in the blogosphere uh, as well. So. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Bianca DeLille from the Science Communication Network, and we work with scientists to try to make the language more accessible to the journalists hmm. and vice versa, get journalists to understand scientists. Um, I have two questions. One is when you're measuring Internet, are you, does that include newspapers? In other words, I read the New York Times online. Does that count newspapers or internet? I've always been curious in these studies. In which study? In the work in that I've done personally? In your look where, you know, where what's big, you know, global warming's big on the internet or yep. online. Is that, do reading newspapers online count? You know what I mean? Yep. I, I think I know what you mean. And um, I've looked at their method. That isn't work that I've done. That's from the Project for Excellence in Journalism. And they oh, have okay. their methods. And... Uh, I don't think that they're covering online consumption of traditional media as, as new media. Okay. I think they're considering it traditional media. And then the other question I have is I've been really concerned about, uh, I'm based in Washington, D.C., so it's everywhere, the politiciza politicization, you know what I mean, of the issue. So in communicating about science, how can we get around that? In other words, you know, our scientists are known as, not our science communication network, but just there are scientists that are, believe in climate change and then there's those who don't. So do they automatically get put in categories? Or is there a way science can help depoliticize it? There's a big question for yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, um, yeah, there are many ways to address that and thinking about different facets of the climate science may be a way of getting into the issues of how to deal with it. I mean, just introducing this panel, as Matt had pointed out, that we aren't moving forward on an advo in any kind of advocacy position, but trying to work through some of the contours of these interactions to help make more informed choices, to maybe, to ideally be uh, expanding or, or broadening this spectrum of possibility for appropriate action, whatever that may be. Uh, I don't think that there can be this movement away from the politicization, but I think it can be tempered depending upon what we're talking about. And that's what I was trying to get at with those panels a bit. I mean, there needs to be a vigorous debate about what's happening uh, next for the successor to the Kyoto Protocol. That needs to happen, and mass media can facilitate that. 
Well, scientists are usually considered unbiased, and they still can play this non-advocacy role, but is it still being perceived that way, do you think? Yep, it's a, it's a challenge. It's a big uh, challenge, and though some have, have uh, worked through this quite effectively. You mentioned Andy Revkin. Uh, many people consider his work to be uh, effectively moving through this treacherous, politicized terrain. But, you know, he upsets people along the way, but that's his role. That if you agree with everything he's written since 1980 on this issue, that maybe there's something wrong with you. Because he's taken up different <laughs> views over time, and that's part of his role as a journalist. Uh, let me, uh, l let's move on to the next uh, presentation. I, 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 your, your, your question might actually speak to the second presentation. I'll give you the first, I'll give you the first question in the next, in the next Q&A if, if oh, all we right. can. Because <laughs> okay. uh, um, we, we also then have um, a discussion session at the end of all, all three panels. Can you squeeze so. a point in? A so, short point. Yeah, sure, go ahead. All right, short point is when you measure the internet, there's kind of a problem. Um, the amount of articles on blogs, uh, it's not necessarily representative of the amount of interest that's out there. And so in the midst of this, all the CRU stuff, there's been a huge spike in the number of articles, but if you look at Google search numbers, um, they don't change. So there's different ways of measuring it. And there's some question as to whether this is an artifact. So I just wanted to throw that in. I think I understand that. Yeah, I think that they've done their best to, to compare apples to apples and not apples to oranges in that way, that they're comparing the trends within the blogosphere instead of blogosphere versus traditional media, if I understand that correctly. Okay, um, I'm going to kind of take off where, uh, take up where uh, Max left off, and, and I, I am going to talk about uh, patterns in news coverage, and, and particularly uh, this idea of, of, of how uh, climate change